Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Sarah Hendrickson. I'm the Adult Services Librarian here at McFarland Public Library. And it is my honor to introduce Dorothea Salo to you. Uh, she is a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, a distinguished faculty associate. I've actually had the pleasure of having her as a professor for some of my classes in their information school. Uh, highly recommend them. And they actually tie in a little bit to what we're going to hear about tonight, which is your family history, audio, visual, and digital. So lots of different memories and how do we go about saving those? So. We're gonna do a little switch out with the computer so that hers is hooked up to our HDMI cord. Okay. Is that you will be in hock to monoprice.com for the rest of your life um, just for cables <laughs> and adapters because there's so, uh, so many different kinds of cables. The 20th century, it turns out, was a phenomenal time for innovation, right? For technological innovation in how we record the world around us. The thing about experimentation though, is that a lot of experiments fail, <laughs> but not before somebody has recorded something irreplaceable um, onto it. And now if you're a librarian or an archivist or anybody concerned with maintaining our connection to the past, um, you have a problem. <laughs> so what I'm here to talk about tonight is like all of us, all of us have this problem in our families now and what in the world um, do we do about it? And why is it important to solve this problem for ourselves, for our families, and for our communities? Uh, have to do the quick Badger Talks commercial. <laughs> I'm here on behalf of Badger Talks. Badger Talks is a program of the University of Wisconsin at Madison that sends people who know stuff at the university out to organizations all over Wisconsin to talk about the stuff that we know. Um, I've been doing Badger Talks for ooh, 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 close to a decade now, I think. Um, have a website, and, and you know they're phenomenal. This is actually one of the best things about my job. They have a website, uh, it lists the people who are willing to come out and what their expertise areas are and the kinds of talks that they're ready to deliver. Um, pretty much any organization in Wisconsin, two Badger talks a year at no cost. The McFarland Public Library is not paying anything for me to be here tonight, right? The Wisconsin idea is important and this is one way that the University of Wisconsin at Madison observes it. So if you'd be interested in having an expert on almost anything under the sun, <laughs> come out and talk to your group, um, check out the Badger Talks website. And I believe it is just badgertalks.wisp.edu. All right, so let's take a moment. Take a moment and think. What's in your closet? <laughs> not, not the clothes. Um, though, you know, style and floppy disk couture, if you have that, <laughs> might be worth keeping. Um, but I'm talking about a thing that's really common in a lot of families where the, 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 the evidence of the family's history is in a box at the bottom of a closet somewhere. And what's in that box can vary. Very commonly there's going to be photographs, which I'm not going to talk about tonight, but if you're interested in, during Q&A, I'm totally willing to talk about that. Um, so photos really often, sometimes uh, documentary evidence like uh, marriage licenses, like letters. Um, but then there's the stuff that I am gonna be talking about tonight, which is film, which is video, which is a situation that one of my students a while ago came to me with. Um, she came to me actually, let me grab this. What are these? Anybody even recognize this? What is this? This is a micro cassette tape. Better known to most people as an answering machine tape. And that is what she brought me. She says, this is an answering machine tape. Can you help? It's like, yep, 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 yep. I've got, these were super common in 1970s, 1980s uh, for social scientists, actually, when they're recording interviews for, for their research. 
So there are little portable micro cassette players that you can still get, and I have a couple. <laughs> so uh, got the recording, no problem, gave it to her. And uh, gave her the heads on, said, you can listen to this right now. And she did, and she started crying. I felt horrible. I was like, whoa, what's, uh, if, if you don't mind me asking what's on there. And she says, um, my grandmother passed away a few months ago. And as far as anybody in my family knows, this answering machine tape with, it, with its message it's the only recording that we have of her voice. I haven't heard her voice until now. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, these media can hold a lot of meaning for people. Some examples <laughs> from some of the work that I've done over the years. This is from West Bend, Wisconsin. It's a LP, long playing record, it's vinyl. Um, of the high school concert band and a concert that they did um, in 1969. And if you think about 1969, getting a, a vinyl record pressed of a high school band concert, that's got to have been expensive, right? You don't just do that on a whim. So I was really curious why this happened. And if you flip over the, um, the sleeve here, you find out why. Turns out this was a tribute concert to a young man who had been in the band um, and had graduated and then had gone over to Vietnam and had not come home. So I was proud to have my hands on this and to be able to recast it because I'm not too worried about the preservability of vinyl if you keep it reasonably cool um, and only play it on function, well-functioning players. It's probably gonna be fine. Um, but to put it in a, recast it in a form that more people could, could access and could listen to, because, wow, actually, this band was pretty good. <laughs> I enjoyed listening to this one. Um, and this, an example of Wisconsin treasure. The photo here, uh, which, courtesy, again, of Banker and Area Historical Society, comes from 1961. Um, the child on the left here, his name is Peter Holmund. Um, he's still around, and he's still in the, the Banger lacrosse general area. The gentleman that he is talking to um, is, is his best friend. His best friend's name is John Davis, and in 1961, he was 85 years old. And John Davis was a chief of the Ho-Chunk people. So what Bangor Area Historical Society came to me with was an open reel tape. Anybody have or remember open reel tapes? They're about, you know, the typical ones are about yay big. Um, they're, they're round and there's actual tape in them. They're like a cassette tape in a different housing, basically. Um, and they're incredibly perishable for a lot of different reasons. If you have any of these in your home, and you would like them to survive, if, you, if those recordings are important to you, please get them dealt with now. Um, because, you know, I am clawing the edges of the podium here because these things were not manufactured well and they break in like incredible numbers of ways. So the tape of Peter here interviewing John Davis, um, his father actually, Peter's father was also there kind of prompting him. It's kind of a, you know, informal oral history, if you will. But my gosh, it's fascinating. Like several hours of Peter and his dad basically asking John about his, his life. Um, far as I know, and I have looked, this is the only recording extant of John Davis's, of John Davis in his own words. There are photos of him. If you go to the Wisconsin Historical Society website and you look, you can find other pictures of John Davis. This is the only recording that we have, as far as I know, of his voice. And the tape was deteriorating pretty badly. <laughs> it was not in good shape. Um, so I did, I, I you know, made an educated guess as to what was wrong with it, said, got back with the Historical Society and said, I'm gonna have to bake this, all right? Which is, Something up? No, nope. streaming. Okay. 
Um, I'm gonna have to bake this, which is a thing that you do with tapes that have a certain kind of failure called sticky shed syndrome. Um, and got this trick from an actual AV archivist. There are ovens that you can buy that are specifically meant for baking tapes. They're like four figures. You don't need that. Get a food dehydrator. Works fine. You set it to about 130, you leave it overnight, and most likely the tape is then going to play back funny. The things you learn. <laughs> Especially about keeping costs down. But yeah, that was a Wisconsin treasure that I held in my hands right there and saved for future generations. And the thought I want you to, I want to leave you all with tonight is the chances are at least one person listening to me right now also has a Wisconsin treasure in their possession. Um, let's get those saved. It's important. Uh, so a thing that happens to me actually quite often <laughs> is that somebody on campus will contact me and say, I have floppy disks. Um, is there any hope? Interestingly, usually there is, even though five and a quarter inch floppies, which these are really, really not built to last. They're called floppies because you can actually flop them. I will grab one and demonstrate. These are completely unimportant, by the way. It doesn't matter if they break. But yeah, they flop. They flop real good. Um, usually the reason that they want me to try to save whatever's on the floppy is that it's evidence of someone's research. It's data. Um, in a case I dealt with actually quite recently, it was um, a piece of software that they had written. Gosh knows when, back in the 1990s sometime. It wasn't five and a quarters. Um, but uh, it was software that had made a big splash at the time, and there was source code um, and other stuff on those floppy disks that they wanted. Uh, so yeah, three and a half, three and a half inch floppy disks. Weirdly, I actually have better luck with the five and a quarters. I do not know why this is, which is not to say that if you have three and a halfs, it's hopeless. It's definitely not. Um, but they can be a little bit finicky. Anyway, I did an event for uh, the American Library Association's uh, Preservation Week one year where I basically set up workstations and invited people to bring their stuff in and we'll see what we can say. So I had a gentleman come in with an entire like canister, an entire box of, of three and a half inch floppies. I was like, okay. So I sat him down with a laptop and an external floppy drive said, go to town. And um, at the end of the evening, he had dealt with all of his floppy disks and he came up to shake my hand and he said, thank you so much. This is all of my daughter's schoolwork from grade school to grad school. And I don't know if it's important to her anymore, but it's important to me. This was a weird one. <laughs> Who remembers eight track tapes? Um, I, you know, when I was starting out doing this work, uh, I would do demos. Of, of equipment that actually eventually led to my kids, as I'll talk about. I would do demos of equipment at things like the Madison Makers Fair um, back in the day when that was a thing. And um, when, when people learn that you do this work, one of the first things they try to do is get you. They want to figure out the thing that they know about that you can't do. And so they kept asking me about freaking eight track tapes. Why would I bother with eight track tapes? That was a consumer music format. The point was that you could play music in your car, right? Because the, the, the music format in broad use at that time was again, the open reel tape and you can't play those in a car. <laughs> you can't play vinyl in a car, but you could play eight track tapes in cars so that was a niche. Um, but this is consumer music. It's been remastered a billion times by now. Why would I bother with an eight track tape machine? But I was tired of getting the question. <laughs> so I thrifted an eight track tape machine. And then I got a couple of boxes of stuff from Mineral Point Library and Archives. And, you know, I'm going through it to do the inventory. I'm like, eight track tape? Why? 
but there was an actual oral history on that eight track tape. If I remember right, it was um, not a miner at Pendarvis, but somebody who worked uh, at the railroad depot. So shipping, shipping all that stuff in and out. Uh, but oral history on an eight track tape, talk about things I never expected. <laughs> Lots of surprises in this business. So before all of this nonsense with open reels and eight track tapes um, and, and video formats, don't get me started on video formats. Uh, um, I am still discovering new video formats that I didn't know about. What did we do before all of this happened? Um, and Catherine Marshall, a researcher, information scientist, says that what we used to have for documentation was, again, mostly things like photos and, and documents. And what you would do with those, the strategy for dealing with those is what she calls benign neglect, which is you put it in a box and you put the box in your closet. <laughs> um, and it's not just personal family materials. A lot of organizations behave the same way <laughs> with their stuff. And the chief virtue of this strategy is that often it works. For a lot of different kinds of um, paper-ish materials, if you put them in a cool, dark place, they're going to be fine. So benign neglect, totally viable strategy. What's different now? Well, you know, this is not my entire collection of weird things. I have many more weird things. But there's a lot of different kinds of media, as I said, that got invented in the 20th, early 21st century. Um, so it's not, it's not like paper conservation and paper-like things conservation is, is exactly easy. It's not, but it's largely a solved problem. If you go to a conservation librarian or to an archivist with something, they probably know what to do with it. Some of these, not a solved problem. So these media are fragile. And it's not like, again, paper is not fragile. I can flick my dick and take out a library, right? Um, and I'm being facetious, but I shouldn't if you think about uh, the National Archives Museum of Brazil, which basically burned close to the ground a few years ago. And the loss there is just incalculable. What I will say is that these media are differently fragile from paper. Uh, there are different ways that they fail. Some of them have virtues that make them easier to preserve if you know what you're doing. Um, but yeah, you have to kind of reckon with fragility. For example, anything that's magnetic media which means pretty much any tape. Uh, cassette tapes, definitely open reel tapes. Um, what else have I got here? Uh, videotapes of almost any kind. VHS, mini DV, anybody remember those? Little tiny camcorders, super cute. Uh, those uh, mini micro cassette tapes, let me see, digital audio tape. I just saw a grant announced from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, lots and lots of money to figure out how to preserve digital audio tape. I'm like, dudes, I already know how to do that. <laughs> I have done it. What? Uh, I can't do anything with IMLS. Anyway, um, eight track tapes, etc. Right? Ticking clock. The chemical engineers, of which I am not one, I am a librarian. Um, the chemical engineers say that for most magnetic media, we've got about 15 years before we start seeing just widespread information loss, unplayability. And that's not because of anything that we did as, as consumers, as owners of this media. They just were not manufactured to last. So yeah, libraries and archives and definitely our families are, are staring this ticking clock in the face. Equipment scarcity. Uh, who's thrown out of ECR in their lifetime? <laughs> you know, raise my hand, I have. I throw out several actually because I use them pretty hard in this work and they do break. Um, for now, VHS is common enough that I can just get another one. 
but there are a number of video formats where that's not possible. Um, I have to clutch my players very close to my bosom. I have to be very careful about maintaining them and getting them fixed every once in a while, because if they break, I'm not getting another one. Um, there are some things, I was doing this talk, where was it? I can't even remember. And somebody asked me about um, wire recordings. Time was, this was not a format that was super popular, but it existed. You could record audio literally on metal wire. Um, I was like, yeah, I would love a wire player. I don't have one. They're like incredibly rare. For that, you're going to have to go to one of the big digitization vendors on the level of George Blood because these are just not common anywhere anymore. We're talking about our digital stuff, particularly stuff that's in the cloud. Right? I've got a lot of stuff in the cloud. You probably have a lot of stuff in the cloud. Everybody has a lot of stuff in the cloud. Um, but that means that you are exposed to cloud business risks. Who's heard of mega upload or Kim.com? Yeah, I thought you might have. Um, mega upload was a cloud storage provider run by a real character and not in the good way called Tim.com. He literally changed his name by default, Kim.com. Um, and the interesting thing, interesting for certain values, interesting about mega upload and that eventually got it brought down was um, massive, massive copyright infringement. With the knowing connivance of Tim.com and basically everybody who was running mega upload, it was a place where everybody was exchanging bootleg movies and what have you. So eventually <laughs> the infringement lawsuits caught up with Kim.com and a judge ordered the, the data center Right, where all the servers with all the data were, or it shut down, basically flipped the switch, turned everything off. Turns out it wasn't just bootleggers who were putting stuff on mega upload. There was one photographer, I recall, who had all his entire portfolio on mega upload with no backups. Yeah, did not go well. I mean, he went to the judge and he said, I just let me get my stuff back. I you know, cross my heart. It's not infringing. You can check. They're like, nope, sorry. <laughs> it was too much effort for just the whole you. So that was that. It's also security risks. I mean, for anything digital, always security risks. But a famous example um, was a guy named Matt Hoden who's a technology reporter, Apple was his beat. And so he had all his family photographs and stuff, including irreplaceable pictures of his first baby um, in iCloud, which is the Apple cloud storage service. Uh, a garbage human was able to figure out actually some fairly basic information about Honan, who was of course a public figure, right? And so they called Apple support and managed to con them into giving him control over Matt Honan's account, at which point he just wiped everything that Honan had in iCloud. And no backups. Bye-bye, pictures of your first baby. Uh, so we end up having to think about that stuff where you don't have to think about it as much for the box that's in the bottom of your closet. Even if you do, heaven forbid, um, get robbed, they're probably not going for the box of photos in the bottom of your closet. You'll probably, that'll probably still be there. Um, not the case necessarily with digital stuff. So, wow, that's a downer. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but does it mean that all hope is lost? Absolutely not. Particularly for magnetic media, we have this precious window of time. Like we're sitting right in the middle of this precious window of time. Please, let's use it. So this is a very old, actually, picture of my like lashed together rig in the back corner of the information school library. It's called RAD for Recover Analog and Digital Data. And it's got, uh, oh, it's got lots of things. 
Uh, that's a beta cam deck. That's beta max. This is high eight. That looks like a VHS to DVD. Um, that's my time base corrector. That's my tape rewinder just for convenience of switch. Uh, tape player. A incredibly weird thing called an ADAT deck. Somebody thought it was a good idea. Uh, this is actually one of the first forms of digital audio as opposed to analog audio. Somebody thought it was a good idea to record eight tracks of audio onto a super VHS tape. Um, I haven't had one of these things come through the office yet. If any, if any of you actually have one, I would love to see it. Um, but just an example of the weird and wild stuff that, that got invented. So I don't really, I haven't had any use for that deck yet, but when I saw it, I was just like, oh, I have to have this. Uh, and then, what's that top? I think the top one is a digital audio tape deck. You can see my record players. Uh, um, in the middle there, we've got some mini DV camcorders, uh, various other things. Slides, I can do slides. There's my um, open reel tape deck. It's a beautiful thing. It's a Rebox. I love it to bits. And under that is my 8-track tape player. <laughs> More digital stuff between the two monitors. You know, you, you end up accumulating a lot of stuff if you're interested <coughs> in this business, in this work. But the thing, the thing about this is that when I was first doing demos, I would literally have to disassemble large parts of it and cart it to wherever the demo was taking place. And wow, that is not sustainable. Um, <laughs> that's just not a good way to do everything, especially considering you can see a little bit of it here, just the cable madness <laughs> that gets involved when you get a whole bunch of cable-reliant things together in a server, um, server rack. So it's like, there's got to be a better way to do this. Not just for demos, but also for situations where um, people are not necessarily ready to hand their most precious family possessions over to some stranger who wears floppy disk earrings, right? And is, and is generally weird. Um, they're not willing to do that. So I was like, okay, is there some way that I can take the equipment to them? So I asked the Institute of Museum and Library Services. <laughs> um, oh, wow. Coming up on 10 years ago. And I said, here's the problem. Give me some money and help me solve it. And they gave me some money. Thank you, IMLS. Love you. Um, to build a couple of kits, which are actually in the back of the room for those of you who are here. Uh, and there, there are two kits. One of them is, is Pravda, which there are not many English words with A-V. That's not a common combination of letters. Um, so that one stands for Portably Recover Audio um, and, and Video. Uh, DA, whatever I decided that stood for. The other one is <laughs> Proud, which is... Um, Portable recovery of unique data. I'm proud of that one. I did good. Uh, but you do not necessarily have to come to me to get this work done. And in fact, I kind of had to shut down the service after the acute phase of the pandemic uh, because one, I ran out of time. Two, I ran out of money to repair some of my equipment. Um, so while I build up my nest egg again so I can get some of my equipment repaired, the service is no longer in operation. But there are other services that are. And you can do this. There's a lot of this that if you're a little tiny bit adventurous, you can totally do from home. Um, and uh, if you run into trouble, you can, you, you can ask me. I have an email address. You're all welcome to use it. So let's talk about how that works. First step. And this is as true for an individual or a family as it is for like the Library of Congress. You have to know what you have and how much of it you have. So step one is figure that out. I find this helpful. You may or may not, not obligatory, but I think it's helpful. Uh, the Preservation Self-Assessment Program, psap.library.illinois.edu, free online tool, 
that helps you inventory. And I believe, if I remember right, will give you some guidance on maybe what to prioritize because it may not last that much longer. Um, produces reports on the factors that impact the health of cultural heritage materials, which is a fancy way of saying it'll tell you what's at risk. Um, and it'll make suggestions for where to start. Uh, by the way, Sarah has a print copy of these slides. So if you do not catch all of the URLs, you can ask Sarah for that copy later. So once you have your inventory, you start to make the hard decisions about what you maybe don't want to keep anymore. Because one of the hard truths about this work, especially as we're staring that alarm clock in the face, is that we can't save everything that we wish we could. I think a place to start for a lot of people is weed out your duplicates. If you have duplicate photos, duplicate slides, keep one to digitize, get rid of the other one. Ones, if you're my parents, uh, the, the slides of my parents' home. Wow, that's gonna be a whole thing. But yeah, duplicates are a good place to start. Another thing to look for is materials that have just lost all of their significance because nobody knows what they are anymore. Um, if you digitize a photo, you send it around to all of your family and nobody has any idea who these people are, what this event was, um, I would argue that it's maybe not worth keeping. Keep the stuff that does have known significance. And as I will say later, capture that significance before it's too late. I will talk about that. Um, the reason I say this, well, a few different reasons, but the main reason that I say this is that sometimes people will do the inventory and then they look at all the stuff they have and they're overwhelmed. Um, and so they don't do anything. They put it back in its box and they shove the box back in the closet. Um, make it easier on yourself. I give you permission as a librarian to get rid of the stuff that just doesn't have meaning anymore. It's fine. There are no archivist police. We're not going to come after you. That's not a thing. Prioritize the stuff that still has meaning. Once you know what you have and what kinds of stuff you have, you can decide how you're going to deal with it. There is some stuff that you can probably put back in its box, put the box in the closet, and you're fine. Photographic slides, I'm not worried about them. Really not. Those are gonna, those are gonna last. Uh, if you have polyester film, Super 8, that kind of thing, it's fine. It's fine. If you have any film, um, and I mean actual like film film, where you pick up the film can and it smells like vinegar, you have a problem and you need to deal with it right now. The film that you have is acetate film. Vinegar is acetic acid. So what you have is a film that is suffering from what is called vinegar syndrome, which means it is actively deteriorating. Like you are losing the, the whatever is, is on that film. It, there's no way to reverse it. Um, there's no way to fix it. And you, we don't have any way to stop the deterioration is the thing with vinegar syndrome. Um, so the best you're ever gonna be able to do is digitize it right now. <laughs> um, yeah, that's my vinegar syndr syndrome spiel. If you have nitrate film, I hope you don't, and you probably don't. That's gonna be way back 1920s, 1950s. Most folks are not gonna have nitrate film. If you ever run into nitrate film, however, call the hazmat people and exit the building. Nitrate film spontaneously explodes. People have died. I am not kidding. Um, because of nitrate film. Don't mess around with it. Call hazmat. All right. But for the stuff that's not going to explode, does not have vinegar syndrome, you get to decide how you want to deal with it. A lot of this stuff you can outsource. Not that expensively, particularly for really common um, 20, late 20th century formats these days. There have been services springing up to, to help you deal. 
I want to mention a couple of local services that I think are useful to know about. Here at the UW, the Communication Arts Department runs a media preservation lab, um, kind of like mine, only much more elaborate, and he is not self-taught and knows what he's doing a lot better than I do. Um, and anybody, if you're willing to pay them to digitize your stuff, they will. he will digitize your stuff, and it's going to do, do a good job. So come arts.wist.edu and look for their media preservation lab. There's also an outfit in town called Holder Printworks, and it's, I believe, just holderprintworks.com. Um, does a fair few uh, video and audio formats from the mid to late 20th century, 21st century. Also does photo restoration. I believe he will also do slides um, run by a lovely gentleman called Doyle Holder, and he will treat you right. I really trust Joyle. Um, and I'm not just saying this because a number of our students have done practicums, <laughs> internships um, with Joyle. I, I know Joyle and he's a, he's a terrific human being. If you wanna do it yourself, I wrote up <laughs> everything I learned from building those kits. And it is all at this URL right here. There's a link to a PDF with everything I know about the formats that I am familiar with. So even if you're not sure whether you want to outsource or do it yourself, you can use this. You can figure out what it would take, basically, to, to do it yourself um, and make an educated decision about how you're going to go about it. Um, my email address, by the way, solo at wist.edu. If you have questions, I am happy uh, to, to field them. One thing I will caution you about, particularly if you outsource, <laughs> You don't want a digital equ equivalent of this falling apart book here. Um, one of the things I teach my students when I teach digitization, which I don't get to do as often as I wish I did, but oh well, is that digitizing to archival standards of quality is different from asking somebody to just make you a DVD. If you don't digitize to archival or at least reasonable standards of quality, you're kind of limiting your reuse possibilities. Have you ever noticed how pictures, for example, from the early web, if you look at a very old website, those pictures tend to look really, really pixelated and ugly and gross? Um, that's because they were digitized at resolutions that made sense then, but our screens are much better now. So that's part of the reason we have things like archival standards of quality. Above all, do not let anyone digitize a video that is precious to you to DVD. DVD is bad. The DVD was a compromise. It was a commercial compromise um, for movies. Uh, a DVD is like four, under five gigs. I think mean, it's like 4.7 gigs of, of digital storage. And that's not enough for quality video. It's just not enough. Um, if you watch a DVD actually on a big enough screen, you will start to see the artifacts, the blockiness, the places where they've condensed the, the video data to make it fit on a DVD. So DVDs are bad. The least you should accept is an MP4. And that's kind of the lowest rung of what we would consider archival quality. But it, for a lot of VHS tapes particularly, VHS is not a terribly... <laughs> a great format, it never was. Um, so honestly, an MP4, probably fine. You're just not gonna notice much of an uptick of quality if you really go hardcore or high quality on it. Um, so yeah, that's fine, but please not a DVD. Dorothea, I have a question. Yeah. Let's say you have a family member that's already, this is from my uncle, he's been watching online. All right. Um, <clears throat> he's already taken family VHS tapes and put them on DVDs. Okay. Is there something that he needs to do to re-back those up or put them onto I would actually re-digitize them if possible. Okay, and onto MP4s and were better? MP4s were better. Okay. The question was, if you've already digitized family video to DVD, what should you do? Um, I would say try to get them re-digitized, at least to MP4. Uh, the other reason that I'm down on DVDs, aside from the quality issue, which is enough, is that you know every laptop, every computer used to come with a DVD drive. 
How many people in this room? Do your computers have DVD drives anymore? Yeah, yours does. <laughs> of course, yours does. And you know, I have uh, I have a computer for 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 my kid with uh, with a DVD drive. But for most of us, that's not something that's useful anymore, which is a huge sign that the format is dying. The format is dying. So MP4, <laughs> digital file, save it. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. And once you have your game plan, do the thing. And here's the stinger. You've digitized all your stuff. Yay, go you. Now you have to worry about not having what happened to Matt Honan or what happened to that poor guy at Mega Upload or the other photographer at Flickr who was wrongly accused of breaking Flickr's terms of service. So they wiped his account and his entire portfolio and no backups. Um, yeah, you don't want that to happen. So I have to talk a little bit about digital preservation. Things that can happen to DVDs and CDs and, and discs and literally anything digital really is that they can break somehow or they can get ransomware. Individuals are not at a high risk, I would say, of ransomware, but never say never. Ransomware, people are just garbage humans. So your step five is looking after what you have. Three, two, one, it is what I teach my students and it's what I'm gonna teach you. For any data that you want to be pretty sure of keeping, you want three copies. You want at least two different kind, different setups. So a laptop could be one, an external hard drive could be one, the cloud could be one. What you don't want is, you know, all, all of your three copies are on three different uh, uh, examples of the same model of hard drive. Um, sometimes hard drive manufacturers have bum production runs. It usually happens to a specific model. Um, so if all of your copies are on that model of hard drive, you're screwed. <laughs> so don't let that happen. Three copies on at least two different kinds of media. And at least one of them should be geographically, real world geographically distant from where you are. Most cloud services easily count for this. This is the don't get caught in a tornado or a flood um, or, you know, heaven forbid, your house burning down. You don't want all of your copies to disappear because something like that happens to you. <laughs> the goal of 321 is not to never lose a copy ever of anything. Of course you're going to lose copies, right? We live in a world with entropy. The goal is for losing a copy to be a problem, but not a crisis. If you have those other two copies, you can remake the third, and it's fine. If you have a photograph and all you know about it is that it's a photograph, it's a picture of something, you don't really know anything about it. Um, so you need to do your best to describe what each of the things that you have is. The fancy information science word for this is metadata, but you do not have to be fancy about it. You can do this in a Word document. You can do it in a spreadsheet. Um, you can do it in a Google Doc. I don't care how you do it. Just describe as much as you can about the stuff in your collection. And sometimes you can do this collectively. For example, a lot of wedding photos, right? And you may not know everybody all who's in them, but they're wedding photos. They're important. You want to keep them then you can say this picture through that picture, they're all from this wedding, which took place on such and such a date. Um, the, the, the bridesmaids were these people, the groomsmen were these people, et cetera, et cetera. You can just describe all of the wedding photos collectively and that's fine, but describe as much as you can. Um, and for folks who are getting up there in age, as I am starting to do, and for young folks whose 
uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, whoever, the elders in your family are the keepers of family history. You want to talk to them about the stuff that you have because there is a lot of information in their heads um, that, and I hate to be morbid about this, but that information will pass away when they do. So write it down. Talk to them, show them the stuff. Like 99 out of 100 of them will be thrilled that you're interested. Right? But get that information before it's too late. The last thing you want to do, because wow, does stuff happen. Um, last fall, I completely out of the blue got very seriously and potentially fatally sick. No, it was not COVID. Um, who knew that there were other diseases in the world, but there are. And uh, I, it was caught early, and I'm very, very lucky because a lot of people die <laughs> of the stuff that I have. And I'm not that old, <laughs> in my 50s. Um, but yeah, I could have been gone. And one of the things that I have not done that I need to do is actually do what I'm calling signposting the stuff that I have that's important to other people in my family. When you make a will, when you check your will to be sure it's still what you want, write down where your digital stuff is. <laughs> write down any passwords that people are going to need to have to access it. It's really common for stuff in the cloud. And if you're a little paranoid as I am, and you encrypt your hard drives, <laughs> you want to have those passwords. Um, but make sure people can get to stuff because life is uncertain. Um, and this is a, a really, really sad way to lose family and community history. All right. That is how you save your stuff. That is how you save your family's stuff. Collectively, this is how we save our community history which I really, really think is important. And I hope you will all go out there and save as much stuff as you can because it is getting to be a little bit late for a lot of it. Thank you very much, folks who are here in the room. Thank you very much, folks who are online. Uh, I really do appreciate your time. My email address is up on the screen here, solo at wist.edu. And I can't promise that I will get to your question within like the business day or anything. Um, I'm kind of a busy person, but it, if it gets lost in my email, you have my permission to email me again. And usually by the second time I'm like, oh, I'm embarrassed. Let me actually answer this. Uh, but you will get an answer from me across my heart. All right, uh, folks in the room, folks online, any questions? Any particular formats that you're curious about that you know you have? So um, during COVID, I um, made four albums, like scrapbook type albums, sure. and um, with photographs, and I put as much information as I can. Yay! And there are dates and names and stuff. Um, Perfect. So would I take that someplace to have that? To have it digitized? You could. Or just. Um, there are also freelance archivists who will do it. Um, so you might want to, to look for people of, of that stripe. There are a few in town. Email me. Um, I, I know a couple three people you can ask. The other thing I would be concerned about in your case is the question of um, the album itself and what kinds of, what kind of material it's made of, because there are types of of, of paper of like backing and stuff. It's all that acid will, free. All acid free. Okay, good. That was literally what I was getting at. Um, but you can, unfortunately, some of these albums are really, really cheap ones. Uh, will damage your stuff over time and don't want that to happen. Um, you don't have to be an archivist to use uh, archival product catalogs. A really common one is Gaylord. Um, Gaylord.com, and they have archival acid-free boxes if you still have stuff in a shoebox in your closet. Yeah. Um, they'll be much better than a shoebox. And they have the kinds of things that you would want in order to take really good care um, of documentary materials, paper and paper-like materials. 
So definitely check out Gaylord. Okay. So um, I would want to go to one of these freelance archivists or something. Maybe. Rather than just take a picture with my... Taking a picture with your cell phone. Yeah, that's getting to the point where it's actually a viable and, and reasonable way to do things. There are... Um, you're not going to want to build this, trust me. But there are do-it-yourself uh, film digitization, actually, and um, book and manuscript, et cetera, digitization kits, where you actually do mount your phone above the thing and use it to take pictures. If you're really highfalutin, you would use a DSLR, um, a decent quality digital camera. For most people, though, if you've got a relatively recent phone, um, I would be okay with that. Okay. I would be okay with that. Uh, good lighting. Yeah. Try to, try to you know, put it in a, in a place with good lighting. Be careful of the angle. Yeah. Um, because you can really distort stuff if it's, you know, if it's flat and you're, or it's not flat and you're taking it from a, from a flat angle. So be aware of your lighting, be aware of the angles, but yeah, it's reasonable. Okay. Anything else? Can you tell us the name of that website for the media preservation? Oh yeah. Um, yeah, let me see if I can find it. And I didn't put, I put this slide in today and I didn't put the um, URL on it, but it's, off the Com Arts website, Communication Arts, and that is just comarts.wisc.edu. You should be able to find it from there. The other thing you can do is a site colon comarts.wisc.edu and media preservation, and that should get you right to it. I will fix that when I get back to the office. <laughs> so I have another question. <laughs> So <clears throat> when I take pictures of this album, yeah. so would I save it as an album in a file on in iCloud or wherever? You could. Or um, what I would be inclined to do is, you know, keep the images separate because when you cram them all together into some other file format, not uncommonly PDF is what people will do. Um, but they're also proprietary. Depending on what image software you, you use, there's probably some proprietary thing that they will do. And the thing about proprietary things is that when that software becomes obsolete, so does your, so does your file. So you want to avoid that. Um, so what, what, what I would do is um, keep, the, keep the image files separate and put them in a single folder um, in, in your file system and put the description of the album in a file in that same folder. Think about a Google Docs folder. That's the kind of thing that I'm, that I'm talking about. Uh, I think on the whole, that will be safest and will cause you the least problems 10, 15, 20 years down the road. Can you run them? Can you go through that again? Yeah, I can. <laughs> so, um, Software that you might use to look at your images or to, uh, to you know, brush them up or whatever you're going to do oh, oh, oh. will sometimes have their own kind of put all of this in an album, okay. um, in a single file, in, in, in some kind of thing. And you don't want to do that because then you're relying entirely on that software continuing to be available to be able to read that album. Okay. What it makes more sense to do is keep the various image files separate. Um, and just keep them together. Okay. And save me, um, save it as an album, or I would save. I mean, save I mean, the individual images separately in a separate file. Yep. Like a, under their their name and my family history. Sure, that'll work. Oh, in oh, yeah. Yeah, that'll be okay. all right. That's a lot of work. <laughs> it is kind of. There are sometimes some ways to to, to automate it, but. Thank you. If you want to email me with the exact setup you're looking at, like what software you're planning to use and, and things like that, what kind of phone you have, I can, I can give you better advice. <laughs> okay. Which I am happy to do. I'm 
try that, and that's another thing about file formats. Actually, um, try for file formats that are in extremely common use and that can be viewed in a lot of different kinds of software. So you take your ordinary JPEG, for example. You can look at that in image software. You can look at it in a web browser, um, right? Uh, you can look at it on your phone. You can look at it anywhere. So not a bad, not a bad choice. I don't love JPEG actually because it's lossy, um, but for a lot of photos, it may be the best you can do. Prefer pings, PNG, if you can. Some phones will let you, some won't. I think you're kind of being on me, but no. <laughs> I would just take a picture with my camera, with my phone, yeah. and then it would just uh, up or upload it or transfer it to my computer, my yes, laptop. Yes, good. And then, um, then it is a JPEG, I think. It probably will be a JPEG. And then put it in a file yep. that's saved to iCloud. Yeah. Okay. So then it, that's two of your three. Yeah. All right. You have it on your, your, your computer and you have it in iCloud. And I, have I recommend one. And you have it on, yeah, you have it on your phone. But yeah. No, I have it in my elbow. My actual physical. Oh, phone you have, phone. right. Of course, my you have your actual elbow. physical album. Yeah, that counts. That totally counts. <laughs> <In the laughs> you back of my that's your third no. copy. No. I'll go with that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, worst case scenario, you lose both of your digital copies. You can always retigitize the album. <laughs> Not that you want to, because as you say, it's a lot of work. But what I do for what it's worth. <laughs> so I have my laptop and I have an external hard drive. This is my work laptop, so I have an external hard drive in my office. I have another external hard drive for my home laptop. Um, and I also have an account with the cloud storage provider Backblaze. Um, I like them for a number of reasons, most of which are not really germane <laughs> to this presentation. But I mean, you know, Google Cl iCloud, Google Drive, um, what a, Microsoft, whatever, <laughs> OneDrive, I think they call it. Any of those is fine for most people. I'm not a Microsoft person. I am totally a Mac head. I, I frequently have to teach from Windows, though, so I'm not allowed to be completely clueless. <laughs> well, and actually, a lot of the um, digitization and data rescue work I do, I have to do it from Windows because Apple is absolutely ruthless about cutting off backward compatibility. So there's a lot of things I can do on Windows that I cannot do on, on a modern Mac. Are we good? I think we're good. Thank you so much, Dorothy, yeah. for coming. So glad to be here. I really appreciate it. Learned a lot tonight. Good. So I'm glad you came here. Yes. Gosh. <laughs> well, and I owe y'all an apology come to that. This was originally scheduled for October. And I was like a week and a half out of the hospital at that point. And this was actually the last thing that I canceled because I so wanted to get here. But I was just, I was not in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate um, the feeling much better now. <laughs> yes, thank you for reasons. And if for some reason any of you forget what her email address, just feel free yeah. to contact me. Sarah can get in touch with me. Care Absolutely. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. Also, this will be on McCrowd's cable channel and their YouTube channel eventually here. Woo!